Hello everybody, welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel. Truth first, Christianity in a post-Christian country. We take the objective facts about Christianity, separate them from the subjective and traditional for the benefit of our faith walk. Today I want to draw your attention to a new documentary that just came out. It's called Being Baptist. Uh, it was released on July 22nd, 2019 by uh, Verity Baptist Church and it was directed by Pastor Robert Jimenez. It can be seen in full on YouTube, and the link is in the description. It's a well-made documentary full of passionate IFB preachers and teachers, IFB meaning in, uh, independent fundamental Baptist. But it has some historical and logical problems that I want to take a look at. Uh, first, I want to say that the pastors represented the video are brilliant people, sincerely. They're provocative preachers of the gospel, no question. Uh, one in particular has done... Uh, great work on documentaries, extensive missions trips. I actually wondered to myself if this was a response to the recent release of American Gospel, uh, another video from inside the uh, Baptist realm, uh, which if you have not seen that, you definitely should. Anyway, we need pastors like these guys in our time. Their voices speak to a certain element of people and soul winning missions and Many other definitive Christian works embody what they do. Uh, this is why you will not hear me say one bad thing about them personally. Uh, for the sake of edification, though, building strong tools for apologetics and completing the gaps in the narrative they present, uh, this video is important. Uh, one of the video's themes is presenting the IFB's core beliefs and doctrines, none more so than salvation by grace through faith. Um, and that's quoting one pastor who said, quote, When people think of Baptists, there are certain things people know they believe. There will be no sprinkling, no pouring in baptism. We believe in the Trinity, salvation by faith, and you can't lose it, end quote. In very modern history, IFBs have always existed since their inception over the last several hundred years, but... More came recently out of some uh, Southern Baptist conventions who are moving more toward uh, intersectionality and CRT. So I want to play, uh, for copyright purposes, I'm going to play small segments of it and then just comment on them. Um, you'll hear it right along with me. And here we go with the first one. Here we go. With us through history. We're going to learn of a people this is the first problematic claim right here. Um, listen up. The life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and the movement of Christianity that he started. We're going to learn of the beliefs of these people and how their beliefs have distinguished them through history and have separated them from false teaching and false churches. We're going to learn of the rich heritage of these people and the role that they've played... Okay, so here's the first problematic claim. Um, he's essentially setting up the idea that the separatist groups can be tied all the way back to the early church, presumably as seen in the book of Acts, and uh, how they have this long heritage and tradition. Um, but where are the primary sources for this? I mean, we have the Bible. The Bible tells us what happened. It tells us who the first Christians were, where they were established. Essentially, a case is going to be built that there were Christians outside of the movement that be, would become universalism a few centuries down the road. Um, so what has been done is to idolize separatist movements throughout history, uh, regardless of their actual beliefs, and align themselves with these groups to claim authority back to the earliest church. Uh, there are a few problems with this. By 100 AD, we had a collection of Paul's letters in circulation together. Uh, most of the New Testament books were believed to have been written between 50 AD and the 240s, maybe some written a little bit earlier. We don't have the original texts to verify the idea that there was a separatist group that went off and were the actual, you know... Um, we have some earliest available texts, which are like third generation removed in some cases. Now, there are first century papyri that verify early transmission, like P45, P66. Uh, but one can't escape the irony that Roman Catholicism is often criticized for tradition, but tradition is precisely what's going to be set up in this film. The documentary is attempting to glean a heritage going back to the early church. 
Is there a great difference in tradition and heritage? Uh, clearly the goal is to deepen what really is a shallow pond compared to the uh, broader timeline of church history since Christ. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next one here. This is a lineage of people who can trace their uh, roots right back to the very first church that Jesus Christ built. And we see that uh, flourishing in Jerusalem. That's where we would say that the New Testament local church movement began. It began, of course, with the Lord Jesus Christ. And history would tell us that it... All right, so you heard the guy at first say the Baptists traced their lineage back to the church that Jesus Christ founded. But where are the sources for this? Uh, outside the scripture that at least initially ended up organized in what became Rome in the 320s, and 380, uh, 320s through 380s, I can't think of any primary sources pointing to this separatism as good. Uh, in the Bible, we have Judaizers, Docetists. Uh, it goes on for Manichaeanism, uh, Adoptionism, Modalism, Arianism. Uh, which, which separatists are they aligning with here? Uh, these were found unbiblical eventually. Uh, further, a present theme is the same old, uh, you know, we're connected to the Acts Church of the Bible when it was the whole uh, and only one view uh, in the Acts Church, right? But even in the scripture, there are many groups of Christian converts. Uh, let me read you this list from page 30 of my book, uh, Just Tell Me the Truth About the Early Church Councils. Th these are all various types of Christians that we often don't talk about but appear in the Bible, groups of separatist Christians. Civilian and non-religious Jews becoming Christian Jews. Sadducees becoming Christian Jews. Paulinarians or Paulicians. Christian Jews getting circumcised. New Christian Jews opting out of circumcision. Christian Jews abandoning all or part of the Mosaic law and practice. Christian Jews upholding all or part of the Mosaic law and practice. Gentiles getting circumcised and converting to Christian Judaism. Gentiles not getting circumcised and converting to Christian Judaism. Gentile Christians rejecting the Mosaic law. Gentile Christians adopting the Mosaic law. Jewish Christians celebrating Passover on Nisan 14 and Jewish Christians celebrating Passover on Nisan 15. Um, that was called uh, Court of Deciminianism. It was kind of an early issue in the church. Of Jewish Christians not celebrating Passover. Jewish Essenes becoming Christian Jews. Jewish Essenes adopting one of several Gentile forms of Christianity. Jewish Zealots becoming Christians. Jewish Zealots adopting one of several Gentile forms of Christianity. Uh, Pharisaic Jews becoming Christian Jews but retaining their doctrinal views like disbelief and resurrection. These don't get talked about a lot. But boy, there are a lot of early sects in Christianity. Which one are they talking about that they go back to here? Um, all of these groups existed, and many were called heretics pretty early. Uh, and even the IFBs would agree on this. So who are these groups during the early church period that were IFB predecessors? Further, uh, whose doctrines are they aligned with? And more importantly, where do we read about and learn of them? By this logic, they're claiming lineage with the separatist groups, even though the beliefs of these groups mentioned were totally different after the 1100s AD, mostly. And there are no sources making these connections. IFBs would look at the views of their oft-named Waldenses and Albigenses and call them heretics. Remember, when they, whether they like it or not, their beliefs are rooted in the councils of Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, and Chalcedon, just like every other Christian group. Uh, the premise here is that separatism is good. Uh, in that view, all heretical groups are heroes. If one were to come back and say, no, uh, only the ones that transmitted truth outside of early universalism, I would come back and say, who were they? Where are their writings? Peter Waldo's version of scripture are over a thousand years after the early church period. All right, let's go on to the next one here. We're already corrupting the word of God. Early in the history of Christianity, there was already an attack on the word of God and on the doctrine of the local New Testament church. But then in 64 AD, we... 
All right, so the claim was that people were already corrupting the word of God during the earliest church. In other words, always assume bad intent on those that think different from me. If the speaker means corrupting the oral transmission of the gospel, yeah, we read about that in the New Testament. I mentioned it in the last part. But if the, spe uh, if the speaker means corrupting the word of God as if God's scripture, this can't be because the period predated completely New Testament manuscripts. Let's go on. So what ended the persecution of true believers by the Roman Empire around 313 AD or 312 AD? Well, in 312 AD, we have a man by the name of Constantine the Great. All right, this is just a historical inaccuracy, and I don't blame them for this. This is a tough one. I didn't know it either till I got out of my religious text and studied Roman history from the, from the Roman perspective. Um, the ending of the physical persecution of Christians actually ended with the emperor prior to Constantine named Galerius, and he stopped the persecutions on his deathbed. He died in 311 AD. Now, in 313 AD, Constantine did make a law of religious toleration, but it wasn't, as people think, designed to protect Christians specifically. By providing religious toleration for all, the Christians were included in it. It was a very political move on his part, and a wise one. Uh, so that's kind of just a small issue there, a nuanced one. Trying to destroy Christianity, trying to stop Christianity. So Constantine the Great, he basically takes this approach where he says, if you can't beat them, join them. So he decides, you know, when he goes down in history as being the first quote-unquote Roman emperor who converted to Christianity. Const okay. <laughs> Constantine's approach, if you can't beat them, join them. Except Constantine never tried to beat them. <laughs> this again, there's no evidence for this at all. It's this idea that we assume bad intent on the part of Constantine. Um, we don't have primary source evidence for this, but we do have evidence to the contrary. Let me share a few things with you here. And again, I'm referring to my book, uh, Just Tell Me the Truth About the Early Church Councils. All right, uh, Constantine was in the unique position of having been raised in the court in the Eastern Empire, but as a result of his parents' foresight and relocation, had learned Latin and felt very comfortable in the Western world, too. The day came when Constantine decided he would make a move to gain leadership in the Western Roman Empire. Uh, he marched with uh, Maxentius, and uh, that was the Battle of Mil Milvin Bridge. Uh, he saw the sign in the sky, you will conquer. Contrary to popular belief, Constantine did not make Christianity a state religion. A version of the faith uh, was just the preferred one in Constantine's court, and he developed it. Now, here it is. In 321 AD, Constantine took the crucial step of enforcing Sunday Sabbath observance for the Christian faith as part of his universal imperial vision, one he had yet to share with many. And we also have to remember his mother Helena was a devout Christian. I went into writing this book with the same assumptions, that Constantine was this bad guy, and it got ingrained in my head innocently, just like with everybody, by movies like The Da Vinci Code, but it's just not true. Um, here's another example of, of uh, Constantine demonstrating publicly his Christianity. Quote, despite these efforts, Constantine did offend the Roman senators during a trip to Rome in 326 AD by refusing to participate in a pagan procession. He cut the trip short, never to return. You can get it on Amazon. It's a very inexpensive book. Let's go on to the next one. He wanted to use Christianity, you know, Christianity so-called, as his way to maintain control over the Roman Empire. Uh, this just isn't true. I mean, first of all, let's clear the air on this one thing. A politician uses opportunities to gain power, yes, but it's being used in this documentary to frame the idea that this man is bad and doing it for nefarious purposes, and that's just not accurate. Um, his actions leading up to and during Nicaea don't show this. As we saw, what did we get? He became emperor. We have a religious toleration act. We have edicts enforcing Sunday Sabbath, and over time, uh, Christian ideas are continuing to be brought into the fold. said salvation was the guy did not get saved. What he believed was not true Christianity, but he basically converted to a false 
religion of Christianity, a false belief system, and he decided, hey, let's make Christianity the religion of... Wow. Um, we can look at a figure from 1800 years ago and determine whether or not they are saved. That's pretty amazing. By that logic, no one would ever be saved because IFB doctrines, no matter how much we want to separate them from the Reformation, have influences through history they are totally unaware of. Further, don't we owe the fleshing out of what primary source from that time would indicate whether or not Constantine was born again? We're just not going to do that? Did that even exist then? Or is the speaker just using anachronism to bring forward events from the past and judge them with their particular doctrinal Christian lens and timeline? Here's the next one. The Roman Empire. Let's make Christianity the religion of the, the one. Okay, here's why this is wrong. He says Constantine had this motive to make Christianity just like the Roman Empire, and they're going to. But no, the fact is. Um, the church itself had already begun modeling Roman hierarchical structure, uh, metropolitan, regional, local, with bishoprics. They had already been doing this. You got to remember, the time was very influenced by like Hellenism, which was like a militaristic centralism, a leftover from the Greek Empire. And they saw how effective this bureaucracy was for the growing church. It was already happening. Um, Constantine didn't make it up. If anything, he probably saw that sect of Christians and said, wow, they're really getting organized. That's the one I want to hitch my horse to. If there's a political motive, that sounds much more plausible to me. Um, so the theological dispute came about that split the church before Nicaea. That's the other thing. There was an issue in the church that began to sprout before Constantine even called the Council of Nicaea. We'll get into that in just a moment. On world power, and he decides to have a meeting, and he convenes this meeting where he calls all Christians to this meeting where they're going to gather together and they're going to figure out how are we going to make Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire. No, 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 no. That's nothing at all to do with what the Council of Nicaea was about. Um, he decides he's going to have a meeting of all the Christians that gather. No, we have primary sources. We know specifically he sent out 1,800 invitations. Between 250 and 320 showed up. He invited them to come solve their problem because he was saying, Look, guys, I've been with you for years now. My mother was a devout Christian, we believe, but you're tearing the church apart. Not only is it tearing my faith apart and the faith of everyone else, you're putting the empire at risk. Solve it. And I'll tell you what the issue was here in a second. The meeting had to do with a specific question about the divinity of Christ. A group of modalists evolved into um, a, another belief under a man named Arius from Alexandria, and he began to question the co-eternality of God, right? If you question the co-eternality of God, you have a problem because now God is a created being. So the main argument at Nicaea is this. Arius comes in and says, hey, Jesus is heterousios, different substance than God. And the other side, uh, Athanasius, uh, Alexander of Alexandria, they're saying, no, 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 he is homoousios. He is the same substance as God. And they're arguing, and a middle group under Eusebius and Nicomedia says, well, hey, how about homoousios, a similar substance of God? Well, they couldn't get that compromise one to work because it had already kind of been shot down at uh, minor synods, which are ecumenical councils, but tiny and regional. And they had already shot that idea down. Now, on top of that, um, also, notice the claim, you know, we Baptists go back to the pure beginning, but if you don't believe what Constantine comes to say, you're cast out as a heretic. Just in arguing this, IFB is placing itself among the actual heretical groups that were kicked out. Uh, they're not in the position of having to say, well, they were all heretics, but not us, uh, and they have to say it with no writings, no sources, no nothing. Um, Wow. Anyway, here we go. What they did is they invited all these bishops and, and basically said, if you don't follow what we're putting together here, then, you know, you're cast out. And basically, That's kind of true. When a government leader sets up a meeting and says, hey, 
I want to make Christianity the religion by law of all of Rome. People are going to have to convert to Christianity. They're going to have No. He does not speak. Constantine doesn't speak. He presides. In fact, when he came in, bishops were hitting him left and right with petitions and special favors. In front of all of them, he threw them in the fireplace and burned them. He said, fresh start, you guys solve your problems so we can come out of this room and move on after today. So you're telling me, IFB, that the Trinity, or at least specifically in this council, the nature of Jesus Christ, in it, the Roman Constantine evil and that the truly holy separatists fled from that, then how do IFBs today claim to believe in the Trinity so strongly while trying to take the position on how their heritage evolved, separate from it? Doesn't add up. Whether they know it or not, to claim Orthodox Christianity, they, like every other denomination, abide in the first seven ecumenical councils. Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, and Chalcedon. Oh, brother. ...to be uh, Christians. We're going to legislate Christianity. And I want you guys to help me set that up. Here's what you need to understand. No true Christians are going to show up to that meeting. Because you know what true Christians believe? They believe that you can't legislate Christianity. No true Christians are going to show up to that meeting except for the most prominent and well-documented of their time. This almost suggests a whitewash and a conspiracy, but we have the documents from this council. I have made a whole video where I simply am specifying and reading verbatim the councils of the First Council of Nicaea. I will put it in here so you can take a look at it yourself. There's nothing nefarious about it. And again, I'm not coming from a position of authority. I love these men. I'm coming from a position of I used to think this too until I really got into my church history and actually read these early church documents. The issues are much different uh, than the way they're uh, being presented here. Um, let's move on. There was a group of Baptists, uh, Baptistic people, I'll say, the Anabaptists, the Paulicians, the Waldensians, the Albigensians. Whoa, whoa! Paulicians, Waldensians, Albigensians, Council of Nicaea 325, Albigensians, 1200 A.D. Skipping thousands of years in your heritage story. Come on. The Waldenses. Now, I'll concede on this one because there is a scholar that suggests a second century group called the Boudoir, the mountain people, and he asserts that this group of people became the Waldenses later. And if that's the case, you do have a pretty long heritage of that group. I've never been able to stand, uh, substantiate that with any other scholars. A lot of what's being said here comes from a documentary that came out several years ago called A Lamp in the Dark, and it's about the transmission of the Bible. Unfortunately, that documentary, and I one time, at one time used it as a source too until I went and read those sources and saw, oh, okay, this isn't quite right. It's a really broad generalization, and it is uh, specifically framed to be favorable to a certain worldview that doesn't pan out factually. Um, so, remember, Peter Waldo uh, came, Waldens is named after Peter Waldo. He doesn't come along until much, much later. Uh, and he produced his own version of the Bible. Shouldn't, they be, shouldn't the IFB then be damned for having their, I'm sorry, shouldn't these people be damned for having their own version of the Bible because they've changed script, scripture and translated it? Did they have textual experts? Were they scholars? By this logic, the IFB should be using Peter Waldo's Romant Bible as the authority, even though it came from Codex Vaticanus and not the one that led to the King James Version. He goes on to say that Waldensians were at Nicaea. Huh. When the group is commonly thought of in their own heritage, it's like a 11th, 12th, 13th century iteration of it. Uh, it's thousands of years after the fact. And on the Albigensians, let me clarify this, because something that gave me a headache, too, when searching church history. The Albigensians were a 13th century uh, group in southern France. They were sometimes referred to as Cathars. Well, we see the name Cathar appear in Nicaea in 325 as well. So, are there any connections between the two? Well, first, I couldn't find any going forward. But, when the Albigensian Crusade began and the Catholic Church wanted to root them out, 
what you saw was that all sorts of heretical names were cast upon them, and this became a universal war against heretics. So it was like the heritage went back, but not forward. So the truth is we don't know who these Cathars from the earlier uh, are. They definitely had different beliefs. And just the fact that the IFB is hitching its horse to the Albigensis says, you guys, you got to look at what their beliefs and doctrines were. It's essentially a very high form of not like super legalistic, moralist Gnosticism with elements of occultishness. It's just uh, from what can be made sense of it. It's not uh, anything like Baptist or Anabaptist uh, doctrine. Uh, lastly, this hierarchy being developed in the church predated Nicaea, as I said before, so keep that in mind. During that first meeting of churches at Nicaea, they had, they had uh, taken the position that we uh, churches should not uh, sacrifice their autonomy, they should not be uh, uh, organizing themselves into a hierarchy organ I, I don't know where this comes from. Um, there's always a possibility that I'm wrong, but I have never heard anything about the Waldenses being or represented at the First Council of Nicaea. How could they be? By then the hierarchy was established. You had bishops there and presbyters and um, so on one hand you're telling me they were a separatist group but at the same time they held a title that would have had them at the Universal Ecumenical Council. It just doesn't make sense. Alright guys, we've only got a few left here. Let's try to get them done quick. Thank you for your patience and for bearing with me while I figure out doing a video this way. I will get better at it for you, I promise. Universal Church. Now they called it the Universal Church because of the fact that Rome was the Universal Empire. It was the empire that ran the world. They called it the Universal Church. Now the word universal in Latin is Catholic. What they set up was the Roman Catholic Church. And Constantine the Great goes down in history as being the emperor who sets up this Roman Catholic Church. All right, no, <laughs> as we have already gone over. But, you know, a point that they might have made in this that is one that I make too, that I think there's an argument that can be made for this. We always hear this idea from uh, Roman Catholics of we have this strong 2,000 year tradition. Um, but, and they are the repository of the earliest records. That's undeniable too. Uh, really, the earliest records go back to like only the 9th century, but they do have fragments of things before that, like the intact Codex Vaticanus, several papyri. Um, but anyway, my point is this. Remember, Rome collapsed and the church was all but ruined in the 500s, 600s. Power shifted to the east. This is clearly visible in reading the uh, notes from the First Council at Constantinople. Um, but I assert that the modern Catholic Church can really draw what it is today from the early 13th century, particularly what it laid out and established during the later in councils, uh, during the uh, papacy of Innocent III and after him, uh, Honorius. So editors of early church texts reveal this. Rome was no different at one time than Antioch, Byzantium, Jerusalem, and Alexandria. Um, I challenge Rome's preeminence uh, prior to Nicaea because of accounts like what I see in the Liber Pontificalis um, where riches are totally swarmed into the universal church. And I want to show you this. This is a, another good evidence for um, what happened at Nicaea. This book is called the Liber Pontificalis and it's a uh, the, the book of the popes. It's one of the er collection of earliest histories and the editors over the centuries have been very good about guiding what's true and what's not true. This says Pope Sylvester was Pope during the First Council of Nicaea. Well, you can go through 20 pages of this book and it's just a list of gold, silver, chandeliers, cups, furniture, property, all donated to get the church off the ground, to build congregations, to set up, uh, to set each church up with everything it would need. Um, so it, it's very evident that, that that's what occurred at that time. Um, okay, now let's go over what I believe might be, yes, we only got, all right, here we go, next one, 1955. With Constantine calling a council of Christian leaders in his realm, he didn't want there to be any bickering or fighting amongst Christians. He wanted 
all Christians to be united as a political force that would just help him come to power, maintain power. So That's one part of the story. It's certainly not the entire story, as we've already heard. Um, that's, that's not new. Anyway, tell me in the comments, okay, because I'm only 20 minutes into this documentary. I don't want to waste your time. If this is interesting to you, leave me a comment that says, yes, yes, please do the rest of the video, and I'll do it in two or three installments. If this was interesting, but you're not interested in more, let me know that too. Uh, I got good feedback on the video about the 1689 Baptist Conf Confession, Chapter 1, and I am going to be putting together a video that just gives a brief uh, listing and overview of the books of the Old and New Testament. So thank you all for being on the journey with me. Uh, you can check out my books on Amazon.com slash author slash Nicholas Garrett. Look forward to talking to you all soon. Thank you. Are you getting tired of censorship, not being able to see what you want to see, and all the ground rules constantly getting changed? Please come over to BitChute and subscribe there at Evangelist Nick G. Are you interested in non-fiction American history that has not been told yet? Please subscribe to John Washington's YouTube channel. John was the great-grandfather of George Washington, and the book Shipwrecked in the Land of King Tobacco tells his story for the first time. You can listen to free chapters of the audiobook there, and you can also hear analysis about the writing of this unique book. Please consider supporting this important nonfiction history on Patreon, patreon.com slash shipwrecked book. And finally, before today's show, please come over to amazon.com slash author slash Nicholas Garrett and check out the library of works from the Just Tell Me the Truth About Christianity series. Very informative and fun reads, inexpensive, available in paperback and for your Kindle.